Morning, everybody. It is week six. It is Tuesday. It's the spring of 2022. We are starting the heart at this point. And excuse my voice in advance. I've got a little frog in my throat. Not sure what's going on there, um, but I'm sure I'm fine. I feel great other than the little frog. So here we go. Uh, congenital to heart disease. We're going to start with the anatomy review. And I took most of this out, really used to get into the weeds. I, I assume you know this stuff. So here's, if you need a review on heart anatomy, here's a link that will take you to that. I assume you know the path through the heart. We actually went over this when we talked about vessels. And, you know, based on some of the test results, I don't think some of you actually understand the path of blood flow through the heart very well because you missed a couple kind of easy questions not all of you but um so let's i guess let's do this again real quick so superior vena cava inferior vena cava deoxygenated blood comes in the fetal heart in the unborn heart the blood is shot through or not all of the blood but a lot of the blood which is oxygenated in the in the unborn is shot through the uh the Fos the foramen ovale. And once once you're born, it closes and becomes the fossa ovalis. But anyway, talking about the adult heart. So deoxygenated blood into the right atrium goes through the what's that valve? Tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, and then ventricular systole occurs, shoots the blood out up the pulmonary trunk. We said sometimes this is called the just the pulmonary artery. And then these are the right and left pulmonary arteries in clinical speak, so watch out for that. In anatomy, we learned it as the pulmonary trunk. This valve, what is it? Pulmonic valve. The blood goes to the lung, gets oxygenated, comes back through four pipes into the left atrium, passes through, what's this valve called? Mitral valve into the left ventricle. Ventricular systole occurs goes through this important valve. We've talked a lot about the aortic valve. Ascending aorta. We learned all the di the types of dissecting aneurysms. Debakey 1, 2, 3, Stanford AB. Around the horn, down the descending aorta. Okay, I assume you guys need to know that for sure. Here's just another video that I did. Uh, you can hit Professor Doug's lecture page, and this one will pop up. So, okay. Um, and again, make sure you know the flow of blood. We just kind of went over it, but here's a new diagram I did last night when I was watching my wife's. It was her turn to pick a movie last night, and don't tell her it was so boring that I drew this while I was watching the, her movie. Anyway, uh, this is just kind of cool, I think. So these are one giant alveoli in each lung, right and left lung. And it's that same heart again, I just kind of added to it. And then I added an airway. Of course, we, we breathe in CO2, or we breathe in oxygen, right? That goes into the alveoli, and it loads up this deoxygenated blood here in blue, and it becomes oxygenated. And we can see the path in this heart. And right a lot of you, I think only 20% of you got this question right about pulmonary edema and hemoptysis. So how can this alveoli get filled up with blood? How can you get pulmonary edema, which is basically the alveoli getting filled up with blood fluid? How can that happen? Well, you have to have a beaver dam somewhere upstream or somewhere downstream this would be. Right? So if you had, if the heart was failing, the blood can't be processed quick enough, so the heart, the blood would back up, beaver dam. Or traffic accident. The heart is a car crash. We all know how cars back up. Right? <clears throat> um, a problem with the mitral valve, stenosis or regurgitation, that's going to act as a beaver dam in the heart. A tumor in the heart, a big tumor growing in the left lung. Um, a aortic stenosis or regurgitation where the aortic valve acts as a beaver dam. Maybe a ascending or a dissecting aneurysm 
where the false lumen has gotten really big and beaver damming this right here. These are all going to cause a backup of blood into the lungs, which is going to increase the pressure, and blood is going to leak into the alveoli. That's pulmonary edema. Now here's where a lot of you, you pick this answer. So what if you get a stenosis of the pulmonic valve here? A lot of you said that's going to cause pulmonary edema. No. Where's the beaver dam? What's the principle of the beaver dam? The f you got to know the flow of blood along the river, which is from right atrium to right ventricle. Um, so the beaver, the backup and the pressure is going to go this way. It's going to greatly increase the pressure in the right atrium. What's it going to do to the pressure of the alveoli? It's going to decrease the pressure, right? The beaver dam. So that would not cause pulmonary edema if you had, even if you had a tumor right here uh, in the pulmonary artery, the, the left pulmonary artery, right? The beaver dam here, it would decrease blood flow this way. Okay, so it's important to understand the flow of blood through the heart. All right, enough said. All right, let's talk about that fossa ovalis, foramen ovale, very thin membrane found between the right left atrium. Uh, within the intraatrial septum, it was once, as I said, the foramen ovale. It was once an open valve where blood could pass right through. Mom's arterial blood shot through there into the left atrium because the fetus, of course, the lungs don't work. So we have to rely, we get the oxygenated blood from mom at that point. Once you're born, the fossa ovalis, the little valve, shuts. And by the age of one, this valve is permanently closed. We're going to get into the weeds on that in a second. Just kind of an overview of where we're going. So in the fetal heart, there's the foramen ovale open. Mom's blood comes right in here. A lot of it goes through here. goes into the left atrium. Not all of it, though. You do get some deoxygenated blood mixing with mom's blood. And then the fetal heart, it closes. Once it closes... You don't call it, it's not a hole anymore. You, it's, so you've got to change the name of it. So it's called the fossa ovalis. Fossa ovalis. Okay, uh, here's the, and we use this shot a lot in the heart. And this is, we're looking at the right side of the heart, and we've taken a chunk of the tissue out so we can see specifically, this is a view of the right atrium. The right atrium is actually a fairly complicated piece of anatomy. Uh, but here is the foramen ovale it used to be, and now it's closed. There's a little flap here that's closed, so now it's called the fossa ovalis. There's two parts of this uh, fossa ovalis. There's this thick piece of tissue right here, uh, which is called the limbus. This was part of the septum secundum, the second tissue that partitioned off the uh, the right and left sides of the heart. For whatever reason, it forms like a loop right here. So this is septum, septum secundum. This is septum primum. This is the original tissue that walled off the right from the left heart and created chambers. Um, and that's called the valve. The valve. So we have the fossa ovalis is made up of a limbus and a valve. There's also a sort of a non-functioning valve here called the eustachian valve. When you're in vivo or when you are a fetus, the blood is this valve funnels the blood or encourages it to go into the foramen ovale, and it just kind of that's what it does, right? Then we have the tendon of Tordaro. Uh, that's probably getting too deep, but it's a ridge that you saw. Hopefully, the instructor showed you the tendon of Tordaro. If you follow that down. Uh, right to the end of it, there. this is the region where the AV node is. So electrophysiologists who are doing uh, different procedures on the AV node use this landmark quite a bit. Triangle of Koch is formed by this tendon of Tordaro uh, and part of the AV orifice here uh, where just below the AV orifice, that would be where the cusp of the tricuspid valve is attached to. And then we have another valve here, uh, which 
is where the ostium for the coronary sinus is. That's called the Bijan valve. I didn't label it there, but I should have. The Bijan valve. That's super deep heart anatomy there. All right, so how does, the, how does this foramen ovale close? We said it pressure closes. After birth, the pressure in the left atrium dramatically increases. During fetus days, or when you're, when you're in your mom's tummy, the pressure in the right atrium is much higher than the pressure in the left atrium. So blood is encouraged to flow into the left atrium. But once the lungs start working, the pressure in the left atrium dramatically rise. Uh, and therefore, this flap gets pushed into the limbus, and you get a pressure closing of that, that valve into the limbus. Let's look at a picture. So here is a little gate right here. Do I have my drawing tools? I do have my drawing tools. Let's see if I can get them to work. Um, so when you're in your mom's tummy, this little valve is like this. And you have blood flowing like this. But once you're born, the pressure gets very, very high on in the left atrium here. Much higher than the pressure here in the right atrium. So what happens? What happens is the valve pushes back. Right? That's the valve of the fossil valus pushes back uh, and it hits the limbus here and it's closed. And it'll stay closed because normally throughout your whole life the pressure will be much higher here. So this valvus pressure closed. So no blood can leak this way. Right? And it takes about a year for that to, to close. Right? Basic anatomy and physiology uh, of, of the heart. Right? Got it? All right. So for the first year of life, that valve is pressure closed. But in most people, but not all people, you're going to get a fibrosis here. And the, my little cartoon is you get a little welder come in here. They're going to weld this shut right here. Uh, so it will be permanently closed. Who cares about that? What happens if you get pulmonary hypertension, which we just talked about, and the pressure in the right atrium becomes higher than the pressure in the left atrium? Well, it theoretically could push that gate back open, and now you're going to have a really bad situation where deoxygenated blood is going to leak into oxygenated blood. It's not going to happen in about in the majority of you because this is welded shut so this will withstand the higher pressure but that's not true for everybody so in fact surprisingly um, about 75 percent of humans get that that flap welded shut um, and great but 25 percent of you there's people listening to this right now 25 percent of you listening to this your welder never showed up to work and that that valve has the potential to open and that could cause could cause trouble as we'll see so pulmonary hypertension is a big deal for people who whose welder never showed up to work all right you got to weld this right here there's my welding example within the first year and yeah i think we get the picture picture. Now, so what about the 25% of you who, whose welder didn't show up to work and that valve has the potential to open? Well, I'm sure probably 99% of you doesn't matter because your pressure in the left atria is higher than the right atria. It's going to be pressure shut. Uh, but nevertheless, 25% of you who are listening and the welder never showed up to work, you have a condition called a patent foramen ovale. Sometimes it's called a probe patent foramen ovale. And yeah, 25% of you guys, the limbus and valve never fibrosed together. And that's called a patent foramen ovale or a PFO or a probe patent foramen ovale. Doesn't mean it's pathology. Doesn't mean there's any shunting of blood. And 
Yeah, they. You can still. We used to have one when I taught anatomy in the labs. Uh, we I would always show the students. Look, I can push this probe right through here, right through the right ventricle. And now I'm in the left ventricle, because in that person it never welded shut. Some hearts are welded. Most hearts, 75% of hearts are welded shut. So that's a probe patent for amino volley. So what? Well, as I already said, um, as long as you have a normal pressures in your lung and in your heart. As long as the left atrial pressure is higher than the right atrial pressure, it doesn't really matter. You're not going to get any leaking of blood uh, because that thing is pressure closed. But if you get pulmonary hypertension, and there's what I've already said, this is a normal person, this is pressure, pressure closed. Uh, but if you develop, let's say, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, specifically, it's either chronic bronchitis or emphysema. That's what COPD is. It's a mixture of those two. But if you get a beaver dam at the level of the alveoli, specifically the microcirculation around the alveoli becomes the beaver dam, the pressure is going to back up. Uh, it's going to back all the way up into the right side of the heart. And if you have a propate and foramen ovale, that 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 gate is going to pop open and you're going to get a very dangerous flow of blood from right to left, deoxygenated blood flowing into oxygenated blood. The body does not tolerate that well. We'll learn in the next lecture when we talk about uh, atrial septal defects. The body tolerates losing some good arterial blood or oxygenated blood, but it, the other way around doesn't work. It hates deoxygenated blood mixing with the oxygenated blood because it lowers the oxygen content. If you lose a little of the highly oxygenated blood, well, you can do pretty good with that. You might not even know that's happening. Um, but yeah, so pulmonary hypertension is a problem and it can push open that gate. And now you have a pathological right to left shunt. Memorize that word, Put it on a note card. I'm going to try to trick you and say pathological left to right shunt. There, that's not a pathological situation. It's only pathological when the blood flows from the right atrium or right ventricle into the left atrium or left ventricle. That's a pathological flow. Body can't stand that. Here is an example of someone with pulmonary hypertension from COPD, from heart failure, from anything downstream, any any beaver dam downstream will eventually back up the pressure uh, into the left into the right heart here. And if, once the pressure is higher in the right atrium, it pops that valve open. And now you're in trouble because all this deoxygenated blood just mixed with this beautiful pink oxygenated blood. And you've just now you're pumping not completely deoxygenated blood to the whole body, but you've lost a lot of the oxygen in that blood because of the shunt, and you're going to become cyanotic. You can die from this. So that's not a good thing. All right. So again, the pulmonary, I don't need to explain this again, right? Any, uh, this is upstream. This is where if, if pressure rises in the right side of the heart from any problem downstream, so anywhere, a tumor here in the pulmonary trunk, a tumor here, beaver damming the pulmonary artery, um, lungs acting as a tumors in the lungs, uh, fibrosis around the microcirculation of the alveoli from COPD or other diseases, beaver dam. And we can take it all the way back to the heart. We can go this way. Let's say you have aortic valve stenosis. Beaver dam is right here. What's going to happen? Upstream, the pressure is going to rise. So let's go up against the flow of normal flow of blood. See how it goes all the way into the lungs, causes pulmonary hypertension, keeps right on going, causes the pulmonary, it causes hypertension of these pulmonary arteries, pressure gets into the right side of the heart, raises the pressure in the ventricle, raises the pressure. It can keep right on going, right? We're going to talk about Kussmaul sign. Pressure can go up into the jugular vein. Your jugular veins can bug out. It goes down into the liver, down into the spleen. It can spill over as ascites in the abdominal cavity. Your ankles can start to swell, dependent edema, right? So really important concept. What can cause these beaver dams? Well, everything I really just said. Heart can be the beaver dam. Anything, here's the 
here's the hole we're talking about would be right here. So anything, the normal flow of blood is this way. So any beaver dam downstream can cause this, this pathological right to left shunt or pulmonary hypertension. But be careful, uh, pulmonary hypertension has to be caused by something uh, either in the lung or downstream from the lung. So it has to be this way. Right? That's where you guys got confused on that. And I won't get into that again because we already talked about it. But heart failure, uh, my, uh, mitral or aortic, aortic valve disease, whether it be stenosis or regurgitant disease, not, not pulmonic valve or tricuspid valve disease. That wouldn't do it. We're talking about pulmonary hypertension. Um, that is too far upstream to cause a problem down there. COPD pulmonary embolism that got stuck. Congenital heart diseases causes something called Eisenmenger syndrome we'll talk about next time. Very important term. Um, and then idiopathic. Some people get pulmonary hypertension. Don't know why they get it. Um, there's a theory that endothelin can be overexpressed. And we said endothelin causes a powerful vasoconstrictor. And that would make a, it tough to get blood through the lungs if your uh, your microcirculation is all stenotic because of the endothelin release. All right, I don't need to go over that again. I think we got the point there. Um, what are the dangers of a right to left shunt? Uh, said the body hates it. It's going to cause low, low blood oxygen uh, throughout the whole body. Uh, so it's a generalized hypoxia. Uh, and you may begin to get a little blue looking cyanosis of the lips mucous membranes. There's a chance you could develop a paradoxical embolism, which we'll talk about, uh, which could lead to a stroke or myocardial infarction. We'll cross that bridge here in a little bit. Um, you could, uh, thrombus formation could occur in the, in the hole in the heart now, because if you have right pressure is higher than the left pressure, now you've opened you basically created a foraminal volley uh, and laminar blood flow will not occur there. And it's a good place for bugs to stick and it's a good place for thrombus to stick as well. So you can get bugs, uh, kind of a bug buildup in the, in the fossa ovalis. I guess it's really a foraminal volley now because it's open. Uh, and if that, that big bug party breaks loose, you got yourself an embolism. More dangerously, you get yourself an arterial embolism, which is called a septic embolism. We've already covered all that stuff before. Um, yeah, generalized hypoxia, the body doesn't tolerate it. Uh, you become cyanotic, your tissue becomes hypoperfused, hypo uh, your heart, your lungs, your brain, everything starts it's craving oxygen because it's not getting oxygen, and you become you get the signs, the classic signs of hypoxia, which is a, a blanching, which means white or paler around the lips. More serious, your lips and your tongue and your mucous membranes, your mouth can start becoming blue in color, very dangerous condition. The nail beds become blue as well, another place to look. Uh, people of color, you can look at their mucous membranes and their nail beds to see blue. Uh, the skin, you can you will have trouble seeing blanching on people of color, uh, but you can still look at their mucous membranes and their nail beds. Uh, how will the patient present? They will have dyspnea, exertional dyspnea. They walk up the stairs and they just don't have enough oxygen circulating through the body to power the muscles, and they're breathing rapidly to try to get more oxygen into the body. That will cause the heart to race, tachycardia. That will cause the breathing to race, uh, respiration to race. That's tachypnea. And yeah, you might get like a little, like you're going to pass out pre-syncope. Or you might even pass out. That's syncope. Your brain's not getting enough oxygen. You'll be confused. You'll have no energy. You'll become lethargic. You might have a headache. Uh, you, at the extreme ends of this, you slip into a coma and die from this. So very serious condition. What are the blood work? What's the blood work look like in someone with, with chronic hypoxia? Uh, well, besides the obvious, you can measure. I mean, we, 
you can get those little finger measures that measure your percentage of blood oxygen, which should be 98% or so. That could slip down into the 50s and 60s and 70s, depending on how bad it is. It should never go under 90. I think we all know that from COVID, right? If you have COVID and that your blood saturation of oxygen levels dip below 90%, you need to go into the ER. That's not a good thing. But there's also some other findings that occur. So if you have hypoxia, your body's not going to tolerate that. Um, it is going to stimulate the bone marrow by releasing something called erythropoietin. And we'll talk about that more, I think, in seventh quarter. Uh, but that stimulates the bone marrow to start making more red blood cells. And that makes sense because if red blood cells are now carrying, let's say, 85% oxygen load when they should be carrying 98% oxygen load and the body is starving for oxygen. How can we fix that? Let's, let's get more carriers. So if you get more red blood cells carrying more of that 85%, it'll start to make up the difference. But that's going to cause a problem. And, the pro and that process of abnormally making more red blood cells or just making red blood cells in general now, that's called erythropoiesis, is making red blood cells. Uh, this would really be a secondary eth erythropoiesis because uh, this erythropoiesis is stimulated because of a decrease in body oxygen or blood oxygen levels. So great, we fixed the problem or helped the problem by having more red blood cells. What's that going to do to the thickness of the blood, the blood viscosity? If you got more cars on the road, you're going to have a thicker, more traffic jam. It's the same kind of scenario. Um, so it raises the it raises the viscosity of blood. That's going to automatically bump up your blood pressure. It's going to be harder for the heart to push that sluggish, red blood filled, clogged blood through the heart. So the heart has to push harder, and that's going to raise your blood pressure. So you're going to have hypertension. Uh, the thickness of the blood can also be measured by something called your hematocrit, which is a measure of the thickness of the blood. Specifically, it's a measure of the number of red blood cells compared to all the other stuff. Right? That's a human. You get this in blood chemistry classes. I think it's in next quarter. I believe in sixth quarter. Uh, but normally, here's the. You, know, you can get blood from your body and put it in a test tube and spin it and. Add some anticoagulant to it, and you can see what your hematocrit is. Normally, these these red blood cell levels uh, should be a certain percentage, and the all the other stuff should be another certain percentage, 55% and 45%. Uh, for all of the blood cells, the white blood cells, platelets, and red blood cells, called the formed elements of blood, uh, should be about 45%. People with, in our scenario, who have who need more red blood cells because their their blood is being diluted with deoxygenated blood flowing into it, and the body's made more red blood cells. They have too many red blood cells, and so maybe maybe they have they have sixty five percent red blood cells uh, to the other to the plasma. That's no good. Having too many red blood cells is called polycythemia. I do want you to know that word polycythemia. And there's many ty different causes and types for that, but we won't get into that. The opposite side, what if you can't make red blood cells, um, then you have something called anemia. All right, so more sequelae of this pathological right to left shunt. Paradoxical embolism. My father-in-law actually had one of these not too long ago. He had a small stroke because of it. And sure enough, he had a patent foramen ovale. Uh, so, again, PFO patients who have normal pressures in the left atrium don't have to worry about this. But people who have pulmonary hypertension and have blood flowing through the hole, that's like a little river. What happens if you get a VTE, a venous thromboembolism? Um, let's say you just went, and this here's my father-in-law's story, went on a long plane ride. Cross seas was in, I think, about 10 hours in the airplane. No compression stockings. He didn't know uh, that he had uh, a uh, factor V Leiden condition. Remember that? 
He's a blood clotter. Uh, so he formed blood clots in his great veins in the lower extremities. Uh, and they broke loose. And normally, those VTEs, the embolisms get stuck in the lungs and you get pulmonary embolisms. But what about if you have a hole and blood flowing from the right atria to the left atria? Some of those embolisms on their way to the lungs can jump over to the left side of the heart and now you're in trouble because you got an arterial embolism now. It can, it can go into the heart and cause a heart attack through the coronary arteries. It can go up the common carotid artery, get into the internal carotid artery, get into the circle of Willis and cause a stroke. It's a very serious condition. That's called a paradoxical embolism. And the paradox is that normally, normally embolisms coming from the deep veins of the lower extremities, which is probably 95% of the time where they come from, they end up in the lungs. You get a pulmonary embolism. The paradox is they jumped into the left side of the heart and now you got yourself a stroke. Maybe it went into the superior mesenteric artery and you got yourself an infarct of the intestines. So the paradox is it got into the left side when normally it's not supposed to do that. Okay, everything I said, very dangerous, could go anywhere once it gets into the left side, the heart, the brain, superior mesenteric artery. Here's the cartoon. So father-in-law is in the airplane. Lucky it was a small stroke. Uh, and got out walking around. It jarred loose a piece of thrombus, broke loose and became an embolism on its way, uh, went up the inferior vena cava, got into the right atrium. Normally it would go to the right ventricle, up the pulmonary trunk, get stuck in the lungs. But his went through a propatent foramen ovale because he has pulmonary hypertension, didn't know it, um, and wasn't good. And then it got into the left side of the heart, up the ascending aorta, through the left common carotid, could go through the right brachiocephalic trunk. Anyway, it got into the internal carotid, got up into the brain, got into the circle of Willis, and caused a small stroke. So that's a picture of this paradoxically getting to the left side of the heart. Everybody got it? Okay, where could it get stuck? Could get stuck a paradoxical embolism once it gets into the left atrium. Could get stuck in the coronary arteries and cause a heart attack. Could get stuck in the cerebral arteries, in the circle of Willis, in the internal carotid artery, cause a stroke. Uh, celiac trunk could get knock out your liver. You can get an infarct. What's an infarct? It means death of tissue. So you could get a piece of the liver has died. A piece of the stomach has died. The spleen, remember the anatomy of the celiac trunk. Renal arteries, it could get into there. Maybe it beaver dams partially and you get a further increase of hypertension uh, because the R2A system gets turned on. Or maybe you get an infarct of the kidney. Got it? Got the idea? That, see how important not that knowing the... The highways of the body are so important, knowing the circulatory system. Um, this is some fun facts. Well, not so fun, really, but in patients... So here's a fun, fun fact. Patients who have a stroke, they go into the emergency room, they do an MRI and CT. 30% of them, they can never figure out where it came from. They don't see it. They can see the stroke, but they can't see a cause, and they can look throughout the body, they can't find a cause. Those are called cryptogenic strokes. Cryptogenic strokes, when you can't find the cause. An interesting study found that 50% of these people with cryptogenic strokes, uh, and they did, they did a procedure where they inject micro bubbles uh, into the femoral vein, and not enough to cause any trouble, not enough to be emboli, but you can see these micro bubbles on uh, a special type of fluoroscopy. And 50% of the people with cryptogenic stroke actually had a patent foramen ovale. The strange thing of this study, and I took most of it out because it's, it's not in the board, it's not going to be on your boards. But the interesting thing of the study is most of them didn't have pulmonary hypertension. So there is some evidence that that somehow an embolism can go through a propatent foramen ovale even if you don't have pulmonary hypertension. And we don't quite understand 
how that's working. Maybe they were having a Valsalva's event, incredibly unlucky. Maybe they're constipated, sitting on the toilet, pushing down real hard, and a piece of thrombus broke loose, an embolism. Just as they're pushing down, it raised the pressure in the right side of the heart enough to shoot it through to the left side. We don't know the answer to that yet. So um, definitely if someone has a cryptogenic stroke, they should be checked for PFO like my father-in-law did, and sure enough, he did have one. He went on blood thinners. I tried to explain this to him. You should have that PFO closed because this could happen again. Do you think he did the surgery? Of course not. Didn't understand it. Hopefully you guys will understand it. Um, pulmonary, what about this pulmonary hypertension where where the beaver dam is, let's say it's COPD, or let's say it's left heart failure. The beaver dam is downstream from the right heart. How is the right heart going to behave if it senses the body becoming hypoxic? Because if you have a beaver dam in the lungs, you're not going to be getting enough blood into the left heart. The right heart is going to try to muscle up. It's going to pump harder in attempts to push blood through the lungs and get it back into the left heart. And we said the right heart has an easy job. It doesn't have to normally push blood very far. It just has to push blood through the lungs to the left side of the heart. Easy job compared to the left heart. So the right heart is evolutionary, not very thick. It's not designed to muff, muscle up. And it can wear out in months or maybe a few years. Where the left heart, if it has to muscle up from hypertension, or some beaver dam downstream and it just has to pump. That can last for decades. Right heart can be gone. Depending on how bad the beaver dam is, it can be gone within hours sometimes. If you have a huge saddle embolism, for example. So yeah, so that leads to right heart failure. I guess I didn't um, put, well, I'll save that. Let's not go there. Yep, just using this again. I don't think we need to go over this again, but... So here's the right heart, right atrium, right ventricle. It's pumping normally. Now you get a beaver dam. Maybe you get a saddle embolism, and there's a beaver dam here. The heart has to pump really hard because it senses no blood is getting to the lungs or decreased blood is getting to the alveoli. Decreased blood is getting... you got decreased blood going downstream. Right heart's going to try to overcome that by pumping really hard, and it'll get really big. If the beaver dam is in the alveoli, same thing. The beaver dam is in the... The mitral valve, same thing. If it's in the aortic valve, same thing. Any beaver dam downstream from the right heart will wear out the right heart if the problem isn't corrected. Let's do a case. 65-year-old heavy smoker comes into your office uh, complaining of dyspnea, dyspnea on exertion. They go up the stairs and they run out of breath. Uh, have a history of a patent foraminal volley and COPD. You look at their lips and their gums, and they're a little blue looking. That's, I mean, right there you send them to the ER, but let's keep going with it. You do an exam, and you can do the exam. You do the exam, and there is a really a moderate size heave noted in the left lower sternal border. Right? We talked about that in lab. You also get your stethoscope and you listen, and there's a murmur during systole, right? It's called a holosystolic murmur, meaning it's a whoosh, whoosh, instead of lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. It's whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. That's a murmur all the way through systole. So you think, oh, at that point you send them to the hospital, but you took a chest film anyway. What do you think? Well, let's see, history of COPD. So they probably have pulmonary hypertension. The right heart is trying to pump really hard. Okay, so we see the bump right here. That's right ventricular hypertrophy. Remember, left ventricular hypertrophy would be a bump down here. But a bump up here, the heart is rolled over. Uh, and it's this is classic right ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, but where's the whoosh, whoosh coming from? Well, they, we, are, we already know they have a patent foramen ovale. They probably have pulmonary hypertension, and they have their lips are turning blue, so that means they have a pathological 
right to left shunt. Um, and that's exactly the answer to this case. They did have a pathological right to left shunt, which was calling, causing the murmur, um, and they're becoming hypoxic. Got it? All right, any other clinical findings? Well, we just said the holosystolic murmur. I explained that. That's a whoosh that starts at S1 and S2. Um, it's heard at the left lower sternal border, at, which is the same place that you might see a heave as well. Uh, the whoosh is from turbulent blood flow going right to left. Uh, you should auscultate this with the diaphragm. You could try the bell as well, but it's, these are usually quite high-pitched noises. Um, so diaphragm works better. And, and this is, breweries usually use the bell. This is a higher pitch sound than a typical brewery because it's a flat out hole that the blood is flowing through. Um, you might even be able to palpate old school style if you put the metacarpal phalangeal joint over the left lower sternal border. You might be able to palpate a thrill. Right? So you might be able to see a heave, palpate a thrill, auscultate a holosystolic murmur, all signs of a, a dangerous right-to-left shunt through a PFO. Got it? Oh, back to the 70s. These were the days, right? Let's go clubbing. Um, clubbing is also a sign of a right-to-left shunt. And not this type of clubbing. It's clubbing of the nails. So, and... That's probably enough. We've hit our 50 slide limit here. So let's pick this up on the next lecture. But you can see these nails, they look like clubs. And we'll get into this on the next lecture. Okay, most important part of the lecture is the bird. So this is a beautiful spotted tohi. I shot this in elk corn again uh, in the spring. And students think it's a robin. That's not a robin. Um, that is a tohi. I guess they're pretty common. I don't see these this often. They're usually in the bushes, and it's hard for them. Uh, only in the early morning when the sun is hitting them, like this one, they come up and they sing their song on the top. That's the only time I've ever seen them out of the bushes. Um, but that's a spotted towhee for your bird collection for the easy question. That'll be on the final. See you guys later.